Do you think you deserve higher pay? Does asking for it seem intimidating or even impossible? You'd be far from alone. Most people are afraid to negotiate their salary, but you don't have to be. In this episode, we have the pleasure of hearing from Steve Sutton, Vice President of Development at LI, on how you can negotiate for your best possible salary in your next job interview or current position. My name is Tiffany Roberts from the Leadership Institute, and you're listening to the Lead Your Future podcast. Are you interested in running for office? Want to work on a campaign? At the Leadership Institute, it is our mission to increase the effectiveness of conservative activists and leaders in the public policy process. We offer over 40 different trainings, including campaign management school, on-camera TV trainings, and writing workshops. If you want to make a difference in public policy, visit leadershipinstitute.org. That's leadershipinstitute.org. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining me for the 11th episode of the Lead Your Future podcast. I cannot believe we've already made it this far. If you're enjoying these episodes and this podcast, please click the subscribe button. And also you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Leadership Institute and on Twitter at Leadership I-N-S-T. Do you have any topics that might interest you? I would love to hear your feedback. And if you'd like to hear a future episode of your topic of choice, you can email me at troberts at leadershipinstitute.org to send in your recommendations. Now on to salary negotiations. So first off, why should you negotiate your salary? According to a salary.com survey, 62% of people almost never negotiate their salary. People who do usually make 25% more than they expected, and they find success increasing their salary 85% of the time. Ask and you shall receive. Remember, you and your employer are a team, so negotiation should be a conversation to determine how to benefit both parties most. So let's take a look at how you can aim for the best negotiation salary in these three crucial steps, analyze, initiate, and motivate. First off, we have analyze. Always research the position in detail before the interview. Know the pay range well and know where you should fall into it. Use oddball numbers that are as specific as possible. A study from Columbia University showed that people who used specific numbers in salary negotiation almost unanimously made more than their peers. That research really pays off. According to Payscale.com, a good way to determine how much you should ask for in a position that's new to you is by determining the average salary for that job and calculating 85% of it down to the dollar. So both Payscale and Salary.com can be a good starting point for research. Next up, we have initiate. Knowing when to initiate is vital. Never talk pay at the beginning of a process. It's best to let them start the conversation before you initiate the negotiation. So, in a sense, speak last. As a general rule in negotiation, the first person to say a number loses. So, once they make an offer, it's time for you to counter. But don't be afraid. Countering an offer doesn't make you look greedy. In many cases, it actually garners respect, particularly in sales roles. They will often lose respect for you if you don't. Austin Belsek, he is a founder of Cultivated Culture and an expert in negotiation and hiring practices, says he has never heard of someone losing out on an offer because they asked for too much. So don't be intimidated. Next up, we have motivate. Honesty is vital. So be honest about what you make what you've read about the job, and your qualifications. Give them good reasons to pay you more. Expenses cannot be the main reason to ask for a bigger paycheck. Show them your worth. This is where your research really comes in. Your purpose is paramount. Make it clear how and why you care about the success of the organization and your ability to contribute. So be sure to avoid ultimatums. Never say that you can't go below a certain amount That way, if they give you a final offer and you accept it, you're not going back on your word. Finally, remember that pay isn't the only item on the table. More or less vacation days, varying work schedules, and particular hours are all negotiable as well. Remember that negotiation is a conversation. You and your employer are a team trying to figure out the arrangement that serves you both best. 
So again, there's nothing to be afraid of. You're almost guaranteed to make more just by asking. So just be sure to do your research, relax, hack natural, you've got this. Now stay right there. In less than a minute, I'm going to sit down with Steve Sutton and get his input and best advice on salary negotiation. My name is Tiffany Roberts from the Leadership Institute. Don't forget to press that subscribe button and leave a five-star rating. You are listening to the Lead Your Future podcast. Are you looking to launch your career? Do you want to gain real, professional experience while sharpening your media skills? Then apply today to be a studio's intern here at the Leadership Institute. As a studio's intern, you'll master Adobe programs and get behind the scenes access to media professions across the board. Just go to leadershipinstitute.org and click on the career tab to learn more. That's leadershipinstitute.org and click on the career tab to learn more. Welcome back, everybody, to this episode of the Lead Your Future podcast. I'm really happy to have with me today Stephen Sutton. He is the Vice President for Development at the Leadership Institute. Stephen, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So basically, could you just give us a breakdown of what you do at LI as the VP for Development? Uh, Sure. Um, Development is the word we use to avoid using the word fundraising, Um, and uh, it's uh, Uh, It involves all aspects of raising money for the Leadership Institute. So my job basically is to uh, raise and hopefully exceed the budgets that are created each year uh, so that programs and uh, can do what they do. It's interesting. I started at the Leadership Institute as the vice president for programs, and I was always complaining, why can't we do this program? And Morton Blackwell would tell me, because we don't have the money. And so I started asking, well, what are those bozos in development doing? And so the more they looked into it, uh, the more interested Morton was in uh, getting a new vice president for development. And he did. And then he was looking. It's kind of like Dick Cheney uh, leading the search for the vice president. Uh, uh, and, and then he became the vice president because. And <laughs> so, so then Morton turned to me and asked me to do it. And uh, the famous story is that he asked me once. I said, no, thank you. He asked me a second time a month later. I said, hell no, thank you. <laughs> Two months later, he asked me a third time. And my wife explained, he's not really asking you. <laughs> so that's how I became the vice president for development and uh, not my background. So I had to learn what to do, similar to perhaps uh, others in the same position. So I love teaching that aspect, uh, many things at Leadership Institute, but in particular, how to raise money because I had to learn it same as anybody else. And uh, and we've gone from six to eight million dollars a year now to uh, 17 to 18 million dollars a year uh, with steady growth every year. And uh, um, so if if you do what they teach you to do, it's going to work. Yeah, that's awesome. You've been you've definitely been at LI for a good amount of time, so. I think you're definitely the best person to ask um, for this topic, but what's kind of your experience with hiring and salary negotiation? Well, as in most things, every situation is unique to that situation. So everyone's going to have their own uh, circumstances, experiences, and situations. And so the training that we provide in in most cases is, is general training. So there are certain principles that you need to uh, uh, understand. And, uh, and then you're going to have to adjust according to your situation. The biggest difference is when you are applying for a new job and the salary negotiation that in- ensues. And if you are trying to get a salary increase in the job you currently have. So I think we should focus on if you're getting a new job and uh, because many of the things that you need to do when you're asking for a raise in your current job will be incorporated by the overall discussion of when you're applying for a different job or in the case of someone coming out of college, your first job. So when you are um, doing getting to the salary negotiation process, when you are applying for a job, what part of the hiring process do you start negotiating your salary? Actually, toward the end. Um, and, and sometimes the employer will try to push you at the beginning, uh, but we can talk about that in a moment. Um, 
in most situations, this is broader than a discussion of salary. There are three phases to these things. There's the before, during, and after phase. There's a before, during, after phase on uh, doing your resume. There's a before, during, and after phase uh, of an interview. And there's a before, during, and after phase for salary negotiation. Uh, the first two are different lectures, so I won't go into those. But for salary negotiation, there's a before, and that's before you're even talking to them. Then there's a during, during the interview, usually, and the, during the negotiation. And then there's an after portion to this discussion as well. So when you, so we talked about salary negotiation with, uh, during a hiring process, but what about when you recently started a job, how far would you say is a good, a good amount of time? How far into a job is a, a reasonable time to ask for a raise? Great question. Again, before, during, and after using that model, before you're hired, you may have negotiated some steps to your raise. I can start at this amount, but in three months, I want to be making this amount and or in six months or in one year. Sometimes they promise you a, a review after a period of time with a salary adjustment at that time. So those are all things that you can do before you actually get on the job. During, and that could be three months, six months, 12 months. So it just, it, it depends on, on whatever you've negotiated or spoken about. Once you're on the job, again, the typical is one year, one year after you start or on an annual basis, every December slash January, or if it's a fiscal year, every September slash October, whatever, again, it's, it's unique to the position and your situation. Some companies will give you a, a review 12 months after you're hired and negotiate salaries and increases then. Other companies will wait till the end of the calendar year or the, their fiscal year because they're preparing their budgets then. And there's a different dynamic. If they're, if, you're, if they're willing to give you a review every 12 months, chances are there's money in the budget for raises from your first day. But if they're saying, well, we have a budget, we have to adhere to it, well, then you have to accommodate that. Um, that's okay. But then when the budget time comes, for example, you might be hired in uh, September and they do an annual budget on a calendar year, so they may be reviewing you in, in the December, just a few months later. Or you may get hired in February, and you're going to have to wait 11 months. So again, everyone's situation is going to be a little bit different. You just have to know what that is, and then do your before, during, and after under those rules. Yeah, you basically have to be strategic about it. I, I mean, I would hate if I was hired in um, September and they say they'll do a three month review in December. It's like, oh, wait, you guys, you're, you're that's the end of your budget. So it's, uh, it seems like it's very strategic with with that. Right. And, and, the, and the problem with that is sometimes they'll say, well, it's only been three months. So you have to wait another full year. So now you've waited a year and three months. Uh, and, and, oh, and, no. you know, so that's when I first started at Leadership Institute, they had a 12 month from the day you're hired review process. And uh, I found with uh, 30, 35 employees, every week or so, I was doing another salary review with somebody. And it, it, was, it was just very, to me, unorganized and uh, created a lot of inconsistencies. So I moved it toward every year in December, January, when we do our calendar year budgets. And that's when we review it. Now, having said that, during the year, I, I've made adjustments too. Um, and, and so, you know, there's no one hard and fast rule. So now when it comes to the negotiation process, I'm sure you've heard some really good, um, you know, reasoning from someone for needing a higher pay and some bad ones. So what are some examples of that? Well, the bad ones are when you just say me, 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 and I need and I want. Um, the good ones are the way you're supposed to do it. And that is the, uh, the, the, by, by, by showing them your worth. Um, and this is the before. In the before portion of this, again, there's two, uh, there's two situations, current employment or applying for a job. So um, if you're currently employed and you're looking to do this, you have to do a good job. Uh, you have to be able to go to your supervisor and say, over the last 12 months, here are the things that I've done. Here's the worth that I brought to the organization. I've met and exceeded my goals. I've overperformed. I'm a hard worker. All the things that you would imagine would be in a, uh, um, a, a uh, evaluation report. But you want to be able to make that case. And for that reason, 
and I've done my research, and this is where this applies in both situations. You have to do your research and know what the market will bear. Um, and, and so some of the factors that you have to uh, look at are, what is your experience level? This applies if you're just applying for a job, you know, your first time job, your first job, or applying for a new job. What is the market? What is the what, what does the job pay? What's the experience level factors? Is there an educational kicker? Maybe you have a master's degree that's relevant. Um, I, I don't like when people say, well, I have a master's degree. Well, you don't need a master's degree for this job. So that doesn't do me any good. Uh, I don't care that you have a master's degree. Um, so you have to get a sense for what your, your supervisor uh, values. But when you're doing an analysis, you should be able to say for this position in this city, because some cities have a higher standard of living uh, or a greater demand, a higher cost of living, sorry. Um, in this city, with this experience, I understand that this job pays X dollars or that the compensation is X dollars because a job is not just salary, it's also benefits. And we should talk more about that in a minute uh, when we get to that. So you, in the before section of your salary negotiation, you want to do your research and find out what your value is, what the job pays, and then how you have added value. Maybe you should be at the top of that range. It's going to be a range. Why you bring a certain range. I brought in these accounts. I've excelled and, and, uh, and I've done the job. If you've done a poor job, it's going to be very hard for you to get the raise that you want. So now when you come into that negotiation, you mentioned showing your worth. How would you recommend you show your worth to your employer? Should you come in, you know, prepared with a document um, with, you know, outlining what you've done with your in your position? Or is there another way to do that? Just, you know, just talking with them during the meeting? How how should you go about that? That's a great question, because um, there's kind of two answers. I, I, I like having a document, not necessarily to hand to the supervisor, but so that you don't forget anything you're going to be nervous. And so to have something written down that you can uh, refer to as kind of your notes is fine. It does not make you look unprofessional. It makes you, I think, look professional, that you're prepared. There's certain things that you want to highlight and you don't want to forget anything. So bring in something with you. Some of the variables can be your years of experience in the industry. Another is your years of experience in leadership within the industry. Some could be the geographic location. We're in a high cost area. Your education level, I mentioned, uh, your skills, and then any cert certifications or licenses that you may have, which are relevant. Again, some people say, well, I've been licensed to do such and so. Um, I'm familiar with a situation where somebody got a graduate degree and used that to leverage a higher salary, um, which was ridiculous because they didn't need the graduate degree. So we're just, you know, uh, I don't want to be in the position of being asked to pay for something that is of no value to me. So that, that comes to the salesmanship of the uh, ask when you're in the meeting with the person, try to find out what's important to them. Now, if you've been working in the position, you should know what's important to them. If it's a new job, you may just have to assume a few things, or you can ask in the interview of all the things we've talked about, what's most important to you. But in an interview, in an interview, it would be difficult for you to say, oh, well, I'm really good at that, so I should have a higher starting salary. That's why I like in an interview to, to say to someone if the, uh, well, whether the offer is low or not, uh, that sounds good. But in three months, I'd like to be making 10% more. I once did this, I worked on Capitol Hill for 14 years as a chief of staff to four different members of Congress. And the, the last member of Congress uh, when we were negotiating salary. Keep in mind, I've been a chief of staff to three other members successfully. All three were reelected in very difficult, well, two of the three were very difficult circumstances. So I knew he wanted to hire me based on my experience in the industry, my leadership in the industry, uh, my record of achievement. And so he made me an offer. And I said, uh, that's a little low. I said, I'll tell you what, um, I can accept that. But at the end of one year, I want to be making the maximum allowed for a chief of staff, which, by the way, is basically what the members of Congress make. So he kind of hesitated, but uh, uh, he said, well, how will I know you're doing a good job? I said, because you'll be paying me. 
If I'm not doing a good job, you should fire me. But if I'm still employed in a year, I want the max. So I set the bar kind of high, but I knew I would make it. And so after a year, I went back to him and he honored his word and uh, gave me basically a 50% pay increase. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I feel like that, that uh, requires a lot of confidence going in wow. um, saying that. We'll, we'll get to that, but that's one of the key ingredients during is confidence. So, yeah. but I want to finish the, the uh, before portion, know your value, know the value of the job, get a good idea. And you can do research now. It's so much easier with this whole internet thing. You know, back in the day, you had to ask around, you had to ask people, what are you making for a similar position? You had to do your research. It was much more difficult. Um, now it's fairly easy. You can go online, you can uh, type in your geographic location. You can type in what the job title is. You can, maybe there's some, uh, some, so a variable of experience that you can type in. Uh, if you don't have any experience, that's fine. And you'll get a range for the job and you should know what the range for that position is going into the interview. So beforehand, you should have done your research following up what you said about confidence during the interview, and we'll talk about some uh, questions they may ask and how to answer them. But during the interview, if you've done your research, you should be pretty confident in what you're asking for. And confidence is very important because if you, it's almost more important than the amount you're asking for. If your interviewer sees your confidence and that you feel you should be earning this, they're much more likely to give you more than they wanted to. But if you're kind of shy or not just shy, but lacking confidence, you're not sure, you could tell the number you're throwing out there is not well researched, they're going to blow you out of the water with a low ball offer. It's particularly difficult, for example, on Capitol Hill, uh, people so desperately want to work on Capitol Hill that is often used against them. And so the pay on Capitol Hill is often not as good as it should be. Because people were, oh, I'll, I want to work, I'll do it for anything. I want to be a legislative assistant on Capitol Hill. Uh, and they get lowballed and they agree. Part of the difficulty, supply and demand, is there's so many people that would say yes to that low amount. That's why I, I took the job at a lower amount that I just ex explained with the promise that in a year I'll get the higher pay. Because I knew if I asked for the higher pay off the bat, the member elect of Congress would be very hesitant to give it to me. Because although I had a history of success, he hadn't seen it yet. So I wanted him to see me after a year and then be confident himself in giving me what I wanted, which is what happened. So confidence is very important. So now during during the negotiation, I think this is definitely a question I have is you sit down and you throw out the number. It's, you do your research, but um, I know I've heard somewhere that there's a rule of thumb to you know, ask for 10 to 15% more than um, what either what you have now or what is being offered. Is that, is that usually a rule of thumb for when asking for a higher salary? Yes. You should always, I think you should always, I hate always and nevers, but I, I think you should ask for more than what you would accept to allow the person to give you a little less and allow you to accept it. Nothing crazy. That's why the 10 to 15% rule is a good one. I've seen people come in and ask for twice what the going rate is. And I'm just like, look, this is ridiculous. I had somebody on Capitol Hill applying for a legislative assistant job who asked me for more than what our legislative director was making. And by the <laughs> way, those salaries are public information. So you can go into the clerk of the house reports and see what everyone on Capitol Hill makes for their position. So there's no secrets. And, uh, and, and, and I said, I'm not going to pay you more than my legislative director. And so the, the and so that interview was a waste of my time and their time. And they didn't yeah. budge off that. They thought they were all that and they weren't. So you have to be realistic, but, but 10%, it's just like negotiating real estate. If you come in with a low ball offer, 10% below asking price is reasonable. You come in with 50% below asking price and you're not going to get a counter offer. It's come in confident, not cocky, basically. That's right. And, and, and realistic and show that you've done your research. If you've done your research, 10, 15% higher than, than, uh, than the research is not crazy. And uh, at least you're throwing a number out there. As far as current salary, it depends. I mean, you might ask for more if uh, you feel you were lowballed to begin with and you've really done a great job. We'll get into in a few minutes the actual negotiation and talk about, other than salary, things that you can negotiate. 
because because there's some flexibility that, that the employer may have there uh, that you might not consider. Everyone wants the money. They want the cash. Um, but there's other things to negotiate. So we can talk about that. Yeah, I mean, that's what I, I would love to hear about that, um, about what, uh, what else can you negotiate besides the salary? Some of the things that you can ask for, certainly salary is important. But there are other things that, that matter to people. What matters to you is what's the most important thing. Many organizations do uh, tuition reimbursement. And that could be for uh, your past debt. If you have a debt from college, Capitol Hill, they have a, a reimbursement program. Or it could be future debt. If you, if you want to go to a graduate program, or not just necessarily for a master's degree or a graduate program, it could just be for some kind of certification of some sort uh, that they might send you to. It could be a weekend class. It could be several week type of uh, program. Uh, so no, if you want to get ahead in your profession, in your industry, uh, there might be some certifications that are valuable, that cost money, that you can get your employer to pay for. So it's not just reimbursing you for past, but it's also uh, past uh, tuition, but future tuition. Um, in that same vein, there could be professional development or additional training uh, that may not cost the company any money, but still that you want some kind of a track to future promotions um, within your uh, job title. Uh, there's also mentoring and coaching that they might be able to offer you. Uh, some closer relationship, they might pair you up with someone to mentor you that might be of tremendous value to you. Uh, they should do that anyway, but uh, you should discuss that. Uh, for some people, child care. Uh, more and more people are, are, are having families, and so um, actually fewer and fewer are. Uh, it should be uh, uh, doggy care, maybe, for, uh, <laughs> for people. But having child care options, maybe there's some kind of subsidy or payment for child care. Um, health and fitness are important. Some companies will pay for gym memberships. Um, some companies provide bonuses for people who stop smoking. Uh, there's all sorts of things in that uh, area. And then the one that is really important to people uh, is flexibility on the job. Uh, maybe working from home, if not every day, one day a week, two days a week. Maybe flexible hours, maybe coming in a little later and working a little later. Uh, to avoid rush hour. Uh, things like that can be tremendously valuable to employees. And that's something you can negotiate. There's no monetary value on it, but it has value. And so it's not just um, salary and healthcare and benefits. Always include the total amount that you're compensated in any salary negotiation. They may ask you, how much are you making now? Well, that's not the question that you should answer. It's what is your current compensation? If you're making $50,000 a year, but your health benefits are another 15,000 and uh, there's other benefits that you're getting, uh, you add all those together. And, if, and you're, if you're currently employed, you should be able to ask somebody in HR, uh, what's my total compensation worth? A good rule of thumb is to increase your uh, salary by a third and that's your total compensation typically. So if you're making uh, $60,000, your compensation is $80,000. And so when you're negotiating salary, that's what your answer should be. Well, my total compensation now is $80,000. And you're not lying. You're, they may say, well, I thought you said that your salary was, was 60. Well, that's just my salary. So I'm expecting 80,000 in compensation. You can give me 50,000 in salary if you give me 30,000 additional compensation. Um, there's also bonuses that we haven't talked about. And with some situations, there are stock options. Um, but bonuses for performance is another thing with metrics and in, in, in fundraising, a lot of organizations, if you hit these um, levels, you get a bonus. Uh, we don't do that at Leadership Institute. Um, but if you hit certain metrics that are measurable, measurable, you can get bonuses based on that. And maybe that's a way to package a, uh, a total compensation uh, in addition to simply salary. I never thought about all of those different benefits. I mean, I always knew about, you know, compensating for, you know, a master's degree, but never about, you know, whatever past schooling you might have or, I mean, any of these other benefits. I never thought about those. I always just thought those and the school and 401k and other things. Right. But 
Yeah, well, there's definitely a lot of options. 401ks there. and retirement benefits are part of that. Um, and different companies have different retirement packages. Some will match, you know, you put money in and for the first 3% or 5%, they will match it dollar for dollar. Well, if they're doing that, that's an immediate 5% bonus if you take advantage of it. If you don't take advantage of it, then, you know, if you've been at a company for a year and you qualify for something like that and you're not taking part in it, your supervisor may look at that and say, well, you say that you want more compensation, but you're not even helping yourself. We offer 5%. We match your first 5% you put in. You're not putting anything in. Why are you leaving 5% on the table? Yeah. Everyone should do those things. It takes a little bit of discipline, but you're earning 100% on your money. For every dollar you put in, they're putting in a dollar. Uh, what investment can you make with a guaranteed return of 100%? And so, but again, that's part of the before you should be doing those things uh, so that they will see that you are uh, knowledgeable, savvy, and uh, it increases your value. So you said there's a before, a during, and an after. So what's part of the after? Well, the after is what if you don't take the job? I mean, it's possible they give you such a low number. You, you can't, I will often ask, um, at least I did on Capitol Hill. You tell me the range. What's the number above which I'm going to say, are you crazy? And below which your family is going to say to you, are you crazy? I mean, there has to be a range where there's no way I'm paying that. It's not realistic. And below which there's no way you're going to take it. What's the range? And, and so you should know what that is. And if the range, if they offer you lower than you can physically do or want to do, you may have to walk away. Um, walk away graciously. There is an after. I can't tell you how many times people have walked away from one job, but the interviewer was so impressed with the person, they've come back for a different job at the same place. Okay, that wasn't a good fit. I'm sorry we didn't get you for this entry-level job because it wasn't enough what you were looking for. But this other job just opened up. And although you don't have the experience, I was so impressed with you, I'd like to recommend you for that job. So don't burn your bridges. That's part of the after. Say no graciously, always show your gratitude and respect for the offer, even if it's not as much as you wanted. I have also seen people who just burn their bridge. They, they, they say no and, uh, and then they lash out you guys are so cheap. I wouldn't work here if it's the last, you know, and then what are you doing? You know, you've, you've got, you've taken so much time and effort to make a good impression and then you blow it. So that's important. Um, also throughout the negotiation, send thank you notes. That's important. Uh, make sure you're clear as to what the compensation is. Uh, and uh, uh, just act professionally in the after part of this. Um, and because the part of the after is, is talking about, I'd like a three month review, or I'd like a six month review, or after six months, I would like to be making 5% more. I can take this now short term. You can change the dynamic of the discussion. Even if you know that reviews are every 12 months, you can throw in a review at three months. There's nothing wrong with that. And another part of the after is try to get all this stuff in writing. Because a promise made to you today, and then the person who promised it gets fired in a month, but you're still there. And then you go to the new supervisor. Well, so-and-so, who you just fired, promised me 10% in another week. And they're going to be like, well, where's that in writing? So try to get in writing. It can be hard, but you could ask for offers in writing and promises of future action in writing. Yeah, that's what I thought about with your situation where you asked for that, you know, max salary in a year. It's like, well, what if you got, what if he left or what if you got fired? Well, if I got fired, I wouldn't have deserved the raise. Um, yeah. And if he left, uh, you know, it's a two year term for Congress. So I would have done something wrong probably if, if he was getting booted out of Congress. Uh, <laughs> he had been a Marine active duty for 25 years. I wasn't worried about his uh, honesty or integrity. That's good. That's good. Well, uh, Stephen, that's all the time I have for today. Um, I really appreciate you coming on. I've learned, 
I learned so much. I honestly didn't know much about salary negotiation. And yes, I might actually use it myself. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining That's us. That's fine. And uh, you and anyone else are welcome to reach out to me. Again, I work at the Leadership Institute. Uh, for those listening, if you can't figure out how to contact me at the Leadership Institute, you don't deserve to talk to me. So uh, <laughs> uh, if you can figure it out, I return all phone calls. I'm happy to... Uh, uh, to, to, uh, to help you out. And I want to leave you with the seven magic words for a salary negotiation. When you're negotiating salary and they've given you an offer, and these are the seven magic words that have gotten people significant raises. Is that the best you can do? And if you ask that, you've got to then be quiet and just see what happens. You might be surprised. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Lead Your Future podcast. If you like this episode, please subscribe, share, or leave a five-star rating on iTunes, Spotify, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. It is the Leadership Institute's mission to increase the number and effectiveness of conservative activists and leaders in the public policy process. That's why I bring you on-camera TV trainings, public speaking workshops, debate workshops, speech writing workshops, and so many more. If you're interested in taking one of these trainings, feel free to check out our website at leadershipinstitute.org forward slash training. The Lead Your Future podcast is produced and edited by Tiffany Roberts with support from Jared Cummings. Advertisements by Alexander Chang and Christopher Olson. Executive produced by David Fenner and Morton Blackwell. If you want to learn more about the Leadership Institute and see behind the scenes photos, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and subscribe to Leadership Institute on YouTube.